Okay, for the camera, this is uh, Tuesday, uh, July 24, 2012, and uh, we are going to have Craig Richardson speak to us now on Zimbabwe. Um, he's been involved in Zimbabwe for what, about eight or ten years now? More, about, Even, yeah, about twelve. Yeah. Twelve years. And uh, so from time to time he gives us reports on developments in that country. Uh, they used to be a lot more disturbing and distressing. I, I assume things are looking up a little now. Yeah. But Craig will now fill us in on Zimbabwe. Thanks, Walker. Okay, well today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, where I've been with Zimbabwe, which actually started back in 1992 when I was just finishing up my dissertation. And I had an opportunity to work at the World Bank over the summer and be a research assistant in an area totally separate from my dissertation. And uh, there were that day there were uh, three opportunities, three countries, Colombia, Argentina, and Zimbabwe. And I said sort of almost randomly, well, I'll take Zimbabwe. I don't know anything about Africa. So I, I spent the whole summer working on uh, learning about this country, which back in 1992 was doing really, really well. Um, it was called the Jewel of Africa, and there were all sorts of promising things happening, and lots of aid coming to the country. So um, fast forward to about 2000, 2001, I did that paper and really uh, focused on a lot of other things with my job and, and other areas of research, but in 2001, um, the country started falling apart really quickly. I took a sabbatical to find out why. I wrote a book and a series of articles after that and uh, got very much involved with studying this country. So I'm going to be talking about that part today. And I will also be giving you an update because the title of this talk is Why is the World's Worst Managed com uh, Country Now Growing Faster Than Hong Kong? And that's um, right now is just the, the first part of my research. I haven't yet plunged a whole lot into that, but I've got some ideas I'm going to share with you. I also uh, would welcome at any time if you would like to have questions, you'd like to interrupt me and stop me, that would be fine, although we want to make sure that we go through um, these three parts of this lecture, so I may say we'll, we'll finish up talking about this later. So, um, Okay, and along the way I'm going to show you a couple of interesting tools that I found, some really interesting visual tools that, that um, I think make a really good point about property rights and, and uh, countries in general. Okay, so I started out with this picture of this train set because when I was a boy I had a train set. And um, I started, when I thought about this picture, I started thinking about um, why did I like trains so much? And one of the, you know, one of the interesting things about a train set is you can, you, it's sort of an abstraction of reality. And Zimbabwe is really an abstraction of a larger market economy. And one of the nice things about studying a smaller economy like Zimbabwe um, is number one, there, there are some interesting um, things that mirror the United States. For example, it has a constitution based on the United States. It has three uh, branches of government based on the United States. And it also draws on uh, common law from Britain. So it was a former British colony. So that sort of thing is an interesting parallel, an interesting uh, parallel framework. Uh, and there, it's also a society with um, lots of dynamics, lots of changes. And one of the things that you can notice when you have a small economy like Zimbabwe, and since I've started studying it, I've actually learned a lot more about the United States economy than I ever thought possible. So just like when you uh, travel, and I think most of you have traveled um, around the world, I think you come back and you understand your own country a lot better. Um, the United States economy, as we know, is incredibly complicated and difficult to understand. Sometimes it's like that old story about um, the, the three blind men trying to understand the parts of the elephant, right? One guy's touching the trunk, one guy's touching the, the foot, the other guy's touching the side, and they all come up with completely different conclusions. But when you study a small country like Zimbabwe, you start to peel away a lot, of, um, a lot of complicating factors, and you come back and sometimes understand your own country a lot more. Um, it's also helped me underscore the uh, in, uh, importance of institutions, which I'm going to talk about today. And I think the fact that Zimbabwe is really, if those of you go on to teach, I think it's a great case study because there are so many dramatic things that happen in this country that, that um, go to so far in one extreme into the other. 
then we can really see uh, some, make some, make some very dramatic conclusions. So I'm going to follow, uh, if you're ever fans of This American Life, um, which always presents things in three acts, I'm going to be talking about Zimbabwe in three acts. And the first one is, how do you kill a country's economy and create hyperinflation? And Zimbabwe is definitely exhibit A on that. Um, the second act is that when, when I study Zimbabwe, I start to understand the bias of the Western aid world. And, and I, I'm asking this question, which I'll talk about today. Why are we helping uh, subsistence farmers be better at subsisting? And I'm going to talk about what we're doing there. There's a very big bias in the Western aid world. And then the last is, is uh, where I'm heading from here, which is still in its infancy, but uh, stage in terms of research, but to, to ask this question here about why is it growing so fast? It seems to defeat a lot of the, uh, the typical ways that we talk about it. So, you know, act one, and how to, how to kill a country. So Zimbabwe has all these incredible things. This was a picture where I've been to Zimbabwe twice in 2006 and 2007. And this was in October uh, of you out of my hotel room. And I just wanted to show you that downtown Harare is very well developed. It's a very commercial sector. And at 6 in the morning, you can see lots of people professionally dressed walking to work. So it looks just like um, you know any commercial city in the world. And uh, it also has these incredible views and vistas, one of the great wonders of the world, Victoria Falls. And so it has a lot to offer. It has a 92% literacy rate, highest in, highest in Africa, in the whole continent, one of the highest in the whole world. And so they've had a big emphasis on education, and I believe one of the reasons why, despite all of these challenges, they, they almost never have had any kind of riots. Their people are very um, uh, patient, maybe to a fault, but they uh, have, have sort of escaped the riots and, uh, and other uh, violence that's plagued um, the African subcontinent. And there's just a picture of a mall, because I just think, uh, you know, sometimes there's stereotypes about, about Sub-Saharan Africa as well. So this is right around the corner from my hotel. Um, all right, so the big question here is, is in this first part was that Zimbabwe had this incredibly strong period of growth, um, starting in 1980, independence. And except for a couple of years here in 1992, particularly, there was a drought. But other than that, it was very, very strong. So it was, it was sort of the darling of, of uh, the Western world. And then this is where I started to get interested again because it fell apart really, really quickly. And I wanted to find out why that happened, what did they do wrong. All right, so, well, it starts with the president, uh, Mugabe, who is elected. Uh, he starts out as prime minister, and then he becomes president. He's still president. He's 88 years old. And as he likes to say, he's fit as a fiddle. Um, there have been repeated rumors over the last 10 years that he's on his deathbed. But uh, he, he seems to come back to life like the Terminator. He just comes back and, um, and he, he looks incredibly healthy. And he's incredibly smart. He's shrewd as can be. Um, he seems to always get back into a corner and somehow escape and keep the reins on power. Um, so he comes into power and he's got, you know, sort of in the beginning, he's probably, I would say, 80% good, 20% bad, like they used to say. Um, about now in China. So they, he, he, has a, he has a big emphasis on the education system. It gets the literacy rate up, and there's a lot of foreign investment. And in 2000, this is where things really start to go downhill badly. Because in 2000, you have these beautiful agricultural farms, these big um, mega farms that are world class. And this is a tobacco farm. And Mugabe is starting to get pushed against the wall because when he came into power, he promised all this land for all his buddies who helped him get in, all his political cronies. And um, the economy is starting to falter a little bit, but he then starts to promise these farms to his colleagues, his, his cronies. Now, as I said before, I said Zimbabwe had a strong constitution. They had a strong uh, political system that protected property rights. There, were, there was a system of land titles. People like this who owned farms had a property title, and it was a, it was a freehold title, which means you kept it forever. And um, in 1980, or whenever these people bought these, these lands, they had what they got from the government. It was called a certificate of no interest. 
And what that meant was that the Mugabe government had no interest in this land, that this was bought free and clear on the open market, and they would never take it. Okay? Now, in 2000, for the very first time in its history, the Mugabe government totally threw out that part of their law. Okay? And um, they had to do it through the courts. Now, believe it or not, they still pay attention to the court system. And when I was there, I was asking the farmers who were still there, why are you still there? Um, because all these farms have been uh, taken. And they said, we still believe in the court system. And this, there's, a, there's a Supreme Court and there's lower courts. And the judges, if they, um, if they make a decision, the government generally abides by it. So what Mugabe did, instead of just actually having the military seize these, he actually stacked the courts. And he pushed um, judges that were not in his favor, pushed them out. Okay, so he did it that way. So he's very much, he wants to, uh, on the outside, look at all appearances like it was a court decision. Okay, they don't just have armies come in and take over the over land. But in any event, um, most of those farms had now been taken over. From 2000, very dramatic events happened. First time in their history, property rights were totally ignored. Land was taken without compensation. In, the, in their laws, they'd always said you have to have compensation. And the land was taken. So here's a shot of uh, a woman who is, who is a born and bred uh, Zimbabwe, the white woman, um, who considers herself just as Zimbabwe as everybody else but having to leave. Many of these people left for Australia, Zambia, uh, neighboring countries, and took all of their skills of farming with them. Okay. Most of the people who worked on those farms, or about a million people working, were actually part of the opposition party. So Mugabe really didn't care that these people were losing their jobs. Okay, and that sector was, was leaving. Because they were, they were in the opposition party. People who wanted to overthrow Mugabe. So it was a way for Mugabe as a politically for him to get rid of his opponents and, and trash them. So um, now the question that I had when I started investigating this was, yeah, but you know, Zimbabwe is not just about farming. It's it, farming is only about 18 percent of their economy. How even though if you crush 18 percent, how does it lead to a whole scale collapse? Um, and, and that sort of brought me to starting to really think about structures of economies a lot more than I had in the past. Because when we learn about economics in, in uh, undergrad and grad school, we don't talk too much about the underlying institutions. We don't talk too much about property rights. Economic growth theory just assumes property rights. Okay? So I started to think about what were the mechanisms that led to that. Um, I read this book, which was very influential, Mystery of Capital by Hernando de Soto. Um, in which he talks about how when land is titled, there's all this wealth that's created through collateral, okay? And uh, I actually wrote to him and told him the project that I was working on, and he was very kind to write me back. And we ended up, um, ended up writing forward to my book, and uh, we've had a, a good relationship since then. But his, his was a very optimistic message, in other words, the big problem with the developing world is that most people can't own land. If they don't own land, they don't have a future. They don't plant, they don't need rocks, they, don't, they can't borrow against it. And so they're locked in the cycle of poverty. So his, his message, and here's I've kind of represented Hernando's idea, okay? Where if you have a title of land, and this is where it's, it's shocking how many development economists don't, don't understand or seem to talk about this very much. But when you have a, a titled land versus untitled, what you do is you don't just create this um, little business here because you have all of these other businesses now that start to flourish based on the fact that this one person may be able to buy a tractor. Okay? He buys a tractor with his collateral, and suddenly now you have diesel fuel people who, who are going to come into the fold, spare parts, banking sectors retail outlets, seed production, there's all of these kinds of sideline activities that start to flourish just because that one person may have bought a tractor. Okay? And that's what I, I see over and over and over again by developing economists who have this big debate about whether property titles matter or they don't matter, is they miss what Vasya was calling the unseen. They, they miss all of these other uh, product markets which are developed as a result of property titles. So, um, 
what I wanted to do was to do the reverse of DeSoto. In other words, DeSoto is talking about creating this bloom effect. And I said, well, let's look at Zimbabwe. It's really, it's all going away. Okay? And that's how you want to explain this question. How does 18% of an economy, uh, you crush that? How does it crush the whole economy? Well, that's when I started to look at um, Zimbabwe. When they took 3,000 farms, they also took away 500 banks who failed that year because they lost their title, hold the banks holding the title. They lost the titles of the land. For tractor sales, tractor sales went down from 5,000 tractor sales a year to three. Okay? 5,000 to three in one year because people could not borrow against their land. And all sorts of other um, things uh, went down as well. So you had this incredible implosion of an economy and here's a representation of what's going on. When you have, when you kill an economy like this and you have this implosion, and this is what happens to taxes, and this is, this is a representation of what did happen to taxes. Um, and so now you have a deficit. Now here's a great, if you have students, this is a great explanation or a great illustration of the quantity theory of money, okay? Because what this is happening here is that Zimbabwe can't issue bonds. Everybody's appalled by what's going on. Nobody wants to buy Zimbabwe bonds. So the only way they can fill this deficit is by printing money. Okay? And this is the seeds of hyperinflation. Okay? So you can start to see, I think you can start to understand the U.S. economy a little bit more. We don't certainly have anything on that scale, but we may be on the upper left. Okay? And if we continue the way we're going, um, I think the dots start to get connected, okay, um, between their policy and our policy. And that's, that's again, I think, the, the nice uh, way to illustrate extremes. And, and here you can see, when the farms were taken over in 2000, this is where you had this incredible increase in the money base. Now, the um, money supply. The scale can't go up high enough because it would probably go up uh, to the high, over the side of the Empire State Building if I had to graph the money supply, okay, and over the years 2000-2008. It went up exponentially. 1,500% in 2007 and 2,000,000% in 2008. I was there in 2007, and living under 1,500% inflation sounds crazy. I, I, I came to, uh, I was met by the State Department and uh, they wanted me to talk with business people in government about some of my findings. And I said, what do I, how do I get money? And I said, don't worry, we'll take care of that. So I, but don't, you don't have to bring too much. So I had about $50 in my pocket. And um, the state, or the embassy, the US embassy official who met me said, okay, we'll give you, give me the $50 and we'll give you the Zimbabwe money tomorrow. Uh, it'll be even better tomorrow. <laughs> Like, don't, well, don't do it today. You're not going to buy anything today, right? I said, okay, well, you're going to be much better tomorrow. So uh, she comes back with this huge stack of bills, um, put it in the safe. I was in a hotel, put it in the safe, filled the entire safe up with, with cash. I felt like, like a drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you know, first of all, you know, the issue is you can't put it in your wallet. So you, you walk around and you have a suit jacket, and you just, you know, you put it like in your pocket and it's just bulging, you know. Yeah, and so just the issue of how you carry this money around becomes a problem um, when there are a lot of people who don't have much money. Now I, now, I always felt safe, but I went to the restaurant that night, you know, looking over the menu, you know, a glass of wine, 800,000, uh, steak dinner was 5 million. Um, and, you know, I think I, I ended up paying, you know, it's like the bill came was 8 million. And pulled out this big stack, just kind of, you know, thumb it off, 500,000, 500,000, and then, you know, give a tip for the waitress. Or of a million, so I felt a little generous that day. But in, in, uh, in that particular trip, I had to leave within several days. Um, I hadn't spent that much money. One thing I did notice was there are no printed menus. Everything's on stickers, you know, and in the shops, they just have little light stickers and they're crossing them out with pencil all the time. Uh, but my, my value, my money had dropped um, quite sizably, I think 20% in, in a couple of days. So I thought 1,500%, this is, this is all about all you can take, all right? Um, how in the world are they doing books? And I talked to the accountants. 
how are you doing this? We have, we have books that we have to change every day, our Excel spreadsheets we can hardly handle. But I had no idea uh, that it would come to this. 79 billion percent annual inflation rate. It's, it's more than you can, you can imagine, you know, at the, when you're there at the time. When people tell you it's going to be a million percent, you say it's impossible. And then you say it's a billion percent. How can people do that? It's 79 billion percent. So, uh, talk about compound interest. 98% uh, a day, okay, is what, what that ends up being. And this is from Steve Hanke, who's done uh, work on hyperinflation. And it just edges or just comes in second place under Hungary, although, you know, I, I think these are so close that there's obviously measurement issues when you're talking about this kind of change. So I'd say they probably both get first place. Um, so you're having prices go up every single day, they're doubling. Now the interesting story is how did they stop it? And they stopped it because they found out, and this took them about five years to figure out, there was a German company that was supplying their paper, their paper for money. Every twice a week, jets would fly in with paper from Germany. And I just read today they spent about eight hundred thousand dollars for every jet load of money, which was carrying trillions of dollars. Would be trillions of dollars. Okay. This is the same company that supplied the German hyperinflation of 1923. <coughs> And printed up tickets for the 1936 Olympics. So they got um, a lot of pressure from uh, the German government when they found out they were supplying Zimbabwe. And they said, well, we don't know. We just print the money. You know, we just give them the paper. It's, this is all politics. But they got a lot of pressure and a lot of protesters telling them that they were um, supplying, uh, supplying a regime um, with a dictator. And they ended up just cutting them off. And then Zimbabwe had no choice but to go to the US dollar in 2008. So this was life before. This is $100 billion for three eggs. OK, and this is a man going to the shop. OK, they have a lot of jokes. They're actually good sports about it. Um, they say, they, when I was there, they said, don't ever tell a woman she looks like a million dollars. <laughs> That's like the worst insult you could ever give her. <laughs> uh, so there's the note. Oh, I forgot to bring the note. I'll, I'll pass it around later. I have the $100 trillion bill that Max mm -hmm. kindly lent to me. And uh, it's on my desk, so you can take a look at it after, after this lecture. I think it's the large, Larry, I think it's the largest note ever printed, right? Now, they actually ran out of money to print, to buy the ink, because the ink wasn't imported. So they actually only printed this on one side. And the other thing was that uh, that money, uh, let me go back for a sec. The only money in the world I've ever heard of that has an expiration date on it, please use within three months. Now, you know, if you understand that, you know, the um, velocity of money, that's only going to make it worse, right? So you, you have people spending the money even faster. Oh my gosh, my $100 trillion bill is going to expire in three months. On well, three months, it's not worth anything anyway. Okay, so um, I just, uh, had an article published with Marion Tuppy from Cato um, about a month ago about some good news coming out of Zimbabwe. The goods are back on the shelves, and we talked about that in this article. Since 2008, you've got, notice these are prices in rands and then dollars, one dollar, so for each one of those goods. So stabilizing the currency has helped somewhat. But what I'm investigating is, uh, we know that stable currency can't be everything. You have to have more than a stable currency to have a growing economy. And this is where my research is taking you next. Because if you still have crappy institutions, you still have low trust, um, there there got to be some other underlying reasons why the economy is growing faster than Hong Kong. Okay. Act two, the farming bias in the aid community. The question is, who wants to be a subsistence farmer? I don't think anybody wants to be a subsistence farmer. Yet there is this incredible bias by many development economists to figure out how to make their lives better. Now, my grandfather was in Germany. He, he was slated to get the family farm, okay? The whole farm, the whole works, he was the, the oldest brother of four. And he just said, forget it. I want to be an engineer, I want to go to America. And, and, uh, and, and uh, just 
just like uh, Professor Salvatore said yesterday. Why did I come to America? Every person I know, uh, John Wood, who used to come here, he said he could have, his father left farming. So we can see in the United States, we have about 3% um, of people who are farmers now, where we used to have 99%. Everybody at every opportunity, except for a few, leap at the chance to stop farming. It's hot. It's incredibly risky. You're prey to the weather. It's hard to have insurance, especially in less developed countries. You want to leap and get out of there. You want to go to the city. You want to get a job. You want to make some real money. You want to get out of there. Yet in the developing uh, development community, there is an incredible bias toward allowing people to to get more productivity out of these little half-acre farms. Now, one of the things that I looked at as I was looking at this issue was starting to get interested in satellite shots, and this is an older one. Um, but what you can see here, and this was a uh, Arthur Goldsmith from from uh, UMass um, UMass Amherst, showed that this is a this is a country where if you see all these little areas here, okay, these are all communal lands, and, and I, I've seen this with the administrative uh, guidelines here. These lands have been uh, totally deforested. They have been chopped, the trees have been chopped down, and there's been incredible erosion in these areas. The land has been really poorly managed. Okay? Now the aid community wants to keep, they want to bring, uh, I'll talk about this in a minute, but they, they want to keep figuring out how to make people stay on this land. Okay? Now here I started to get interested in this, um, and I got with Google Earth, I was able to so right here, these were commercial grazing lands versus communal lands, and literally right up to the border here where you go to commercial versus communal, you can see these really dramatic changes. Now, I, I um, showed these photos, and I actually showed them when I was in Zimbabwe, and people had never seen this before. I was, you know, people said they, these were doctored. Um, no, they weren't doctored. There's another shot of uh, the dramatic differences in the way the land's been managed on the left versus the right. Um, on, this is another area of commercial farming. And you just can't believe it, but I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, it almost looks like it's two different photos that have been lapped up against each other. But on the right-hand side, you can see what people do when they own land. They've actually created lots of dams, and they create little spring-fed or little lakes that serve as irrigation for their farms when they uh, have droughts. And these lands were all very well developed. These were the commercial farms. On the left were the communal farms where they had almost no incentive to do anything because they didn't own the land. They were usually owned by a chief who told them from year to year where they would be. So typically the way that the farm is taken care of is the trees are chopped down, you farm it for about one or two years, the soil's exhausted, you never use fertilizer, maybe use a little bit, and then there's erosion, and then you move on. And you go, the whole village moves on, and chops down more trees. So this is why you see a lot of scenes in Africa where it looks really dusty, and just sort of wide open areas. <coughs> well, much of Africa was fully forested um, before this. Now this is the development community, is trying to serve the interests on the left. And I keep asking them why and why. Why aren't you talking about getting these people property titles so they can look more like on the right? That's what's fundamental, is they have to own the land first. Otherwise, all, all of this is, is going to go downhill. This is a shot from a communal farm. Um, not my photo. It's a, but you can see this does not look like the most productive farm <laughs> you've ever seen. Okay? There are a lot of people there who don't really know what they're doing. Um, because they don't own the land. Now I want to show you also uh, just an update on this. Here's, here's uh, Google Earth. And uh, that's the same shot that I was showing you before. And for people who say that these are just um, two photos taken at a different time, We can zoom in. 
And you can see the rows right there delineates it. The other thing that's neat now with Google Earth is that you can, let me back out just a little bit. Check out the scenery. There are the communal farms. Okay, this is commercially on grazing land. And you can just see with very dramatic effect the differences. And there are lots of places um, in different parts of Zimbabwe where you can see that. So okay. question, Craig. Yes. Um, I'm a little confused about how uh, the path that it would take from property rights to, I guess, agricultural education to these people, communal people, you know, being educated on how to efficiently manage their land. Yeah, well, you know, I think the first thing is that there, there is sort of a hodgepodge right now of different systems working simultaneously. So there are still 300 farms left that still have property titles. Um, there are farmers, there are the small scale or the subsistence farmers who prior would actually would learn from the commercial farmers. So when I was there in 2007, I, um, I visited a farm of a, a Danish farmer. It was really impressive. He had like 500 head of cattle, he was making ice cream and cheese and all sorts of things. And we went out into the uh, countryside and he, we met a nearby farmers who he had moved, he had actually helped them rise up from being subsistence to being one guy was cattle farmer of the year. Now, I went and talked to him, and I don't have a picture, but I talked to him at great length, and I said, you know what, and I, I swear I didn't plant this question, but I said to him, I said, you know, you, you got, for, by Zimbabwe standards, he, he had a house, um, he, had, he had about 25 cattle, fully irrigated, and he was dairy farmer of the year. And I said, you know, what, why did you do this? And he said, he said, with absolutely no problem, he said, the property title was everything. He said, I would have never done this if I didn't have a title. So there were some, for some people, and like I said, this hodgepodge system, their total orientation changes when they are able to own land. And so all throughout the Zimbabwe now, there are people who have no rights. They now have 99-year leases, which are sort of going alongside, which are probably second best to a freehold title. Um, that's what China does. They have 70 leases. My point is that when you give people a title, suddenly your whole perspective changes. And you have an incentive to learn. You have an incentive to figure out what's going on. And, and so they, they did learn from nearby commercial farmers. Unfortunately, most of those guys are gone now. So these sophisticated farming techniques, um, they may pick up in college, but they don't have sort of the nearby neighbors to help them out. Yes. Um, we might be getting a little, or I might be getting ahead of the, the where you're going, so feel free to say I'll cover that later. But um, one of the other variables that seems to be very related to uh, property rights is contracting institutions. And so in market design literature, um, there's an endogenous effect between contracting institutions and the property rights. And the data usually is, has some measurement error. And so I wasn't sure if you had caught the data on this, but could you also talk about the, the types of um, contracts that exist outside of purely designation of property rights in Zimbabwe? You mean like business contracts? Um, that could be one, for example. Also, um, government uh, with, with individuals, that, that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know a lot about how that works. I do know that there there have been healthy supply businesses going in to Zimbabwe, and they have, I would assume they go in there because they have contracts. I mean, people, there's still a lot of foreign direct investment that's coming in. They, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but they, there was a, a sense that, well, that was the farmers, you know, but we're different. Mm -hmm. So we're protected, where the government's not gonna touch us. So the businesses generally have Property rights as, as like a Yes. 
within okay. the cities. Okay. Yes, if you have a um, house in the city, if you have a business in the city, you will have you will have those kind of titles. But here's the thing: you say, well, okay, well, the only thing that mattered was, you know, the, the titles were taken away from the farms. Big deal. What I'm saying here is that that had never happened before for anybody. Imagine in America if we had gone to uh, one one type of you know sector that was only one percent of the economy, and then we just decided to have land grabs. The problem is that the trust is broken because you've never done that before, and now everybody starts to think differently about investing and about their future. It's that uncertainty we we got talked about last night, right? Yeah, and so right after the land grabs happened in 2000, and I, I don't think I have this slide here, but foreign, invest, foreign direct investment went from, I think it was 400 million to 2 million in, in, in three months. It just, it just crashes to the earth. Everybody's scared, everybody gets out. And of course, it's so easy in this day and age to do that with a few you know, clicks of the key. You, the, the farmers are the ones who stay because they have all the investment in terms of physical. But in terms of uh, financial resources, they want to hurt. The Google Earth images said that they were taken in 2007. Um, the earlier ones, yeah. Well, yeah, like what we were just looking at said the imagery data was from 2007. Do you think it's changed at all? Yeah, I've been trying to. Um, I think it has. It's hard because the there are different companies that are taking these pictures. And one of the things I would love to have, the color sometimes is different depending on the company. Some of them have more of a, a copper tone, some are more green, and depending on the time of the year and so forth. So it's a little hard with time, time change imagery. I, that's what I'd love to do, though. To, to There's a historical thing on Google Maps. Have you ever, like, have you ever looked yes, at Yes, I have looked at that. Cha does it change? Or is it it's just not that nice? helpful because the, it's the same thing. There's, there's too much abruptness in tone. Especially when you get back, it's like... The yeah, the one thing that I, I, I want to do, and I really haven't been successful in doing it yet, is, is to show the collapse of the commercial farming sector and to show... One thing I do know is that um, all those little lakes you saw, they're all gone. So all those... That all the irrigation pipes have been dug out and sold for scrap. So uh, I have seen that. Who did that? Was that the... The new owners who weren't farmers. Sold everything, sold the tractors, sold the. I saw when I was there, the roofs were stripped uh, on the, all the sheet metal was sold. Uh, everything was, was basically like big auction, and the guys were like, "Yes, let's you know, let's let's sell everything and take the cash," and that's what happened. So most of these farms aren't functioning. There's one of them. That's a picture from when I was there. This is a person who was given a farm. Okay, this was a. And, and that person who took me on has said this used to be a fully functioning tobacco farm. This, this land was given to this person. They had big dreams, but had no idea how to farm, and abandoned it. So it was just simply left idle. Um, it's even worse than that because this is, uh, was actually a full crop of corn. And as, as again, my, uh, my farmer friend showed me, was that one day somebody decided to burn this entire farm to the ground because they said that this is the way they could capture some wild game. Uh, it chased the game out of the farm, uh, out of the cornfields. So they burned the entire thing to the ground. Um, nobody owned this anymore, and uh, that's what happened. So it was just unbelievable to see in a land where they now need food aid, where they used to export corn. They had so much of it. And now, every year they're coming and saying we have a famine. And the World Food Program is totally vested in the idea of droughts and famines and poor little Zimbabwe. You know, once again, they had a drought. Well, you used to have 10,000 lakes. They got you through irrigation. You never had that problem before. You used to export corn. You used to export tobacco to Winston-Salem, where I live. You never had that problem before. Yet the aid community focuses on things outside of Zimbabwe's control as the problem, so that they can ignore uh, the government. Okay. Here's another thing that I, I, I looked at, and I'm part of my, my new research paper, is when you look at the aid going, and this is where I talk about subsistence farmers, there's a project going where every one of these farmers is going to get $8,000 on average in aid. Now this is for a half acre of land, 
And this $8,000 is about 15 times their annual income. Now nobody in, you know, that I could see the World Bank is saying, hey, let's talk about opportunity costs here. What could this same person do with $8,000? Right. I mean, even in, let's make it a loan. Let's not even make it cash. Let's talk about entrepreneurship. Let's talk about training them to be software engineers and accountants. Believe me, I met plenty of smart people in downtown Ferrari. Um, but instead, the aid community is consigning these people to a future with no property titles, to a future where they're just going to be better irrigation, uh, better subsistence farmers. So this kind of uh, short-sightedness is, is I see all the time. And it's, it's very frustrating to see this lack of a bigger understanding, bigger picture. So we continue with Sub-Saharan Africa as the highest percentage of informal of housing of any other in the world, and yet there's very little attention paid to the relationship between, aha, this is also the poorest place in the world, and I think there is a correlation there, but um, there has been, with the exception of Hernando de Soto and some others who have been helping Tanzania and Ghana and Rwanda, all of which are developing really well, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of um, internal debate, and quite frankly, I think there are many in the World Bank who, I hate to be cynical, but actually profit from keeping things the way that they are. Because their job is to get aid, and if you take the aid away, they don't have a job. So I hate to say that, but it's, it seems to be uh, the case. Um, now here's another picture that I took. And here, this was another woman who had just gotten a 99 year lease. This was her house that she used to live in. This is a very typical house for somebody who doesn't own a title. She had gotten a 99 year lease on that land, which is very, very close to forever for most people. And look what she's done. She's now starting to, she just planned this whole house on a brick. And she was having her house thatched, and she was very proud. She just bought windows. She never had windows before. And, uh, so she was playing all this, and I want you to remember that, that diagram that I put up of the network that happens. So this is all happens, right? You chop the local trees down, you gather the grass, and there's no knowledge, really. Anybody can do this. When I want you to see this brick building. I want you to be thinking about the network. There's now created demand for bricks. You've now created demand for brick layers, a skilled job. You now have a demand for mortar, okay? You now have a demand for trucks to deliver the bricks. That there is a whole lot of stuff in that brick building going on that's not going on here. Okay? And, and, and so, like I said, this is happening in very sort of patchwork places, but it's, it's, it's hardly systematic. So now we go to Act 3, which is where I am right now. And like I said, I'm just starting it. But it's, uh, for people who study um, indexes of economic freedom, Zimbabwe creates kind of a puzzling case because other than the fact that they've dollarized, um, they still have a lot of things not going for them. They're in the least free category. The average is 1.2% growth rate if they're going 7-8%. Um, it's no longer a tidy explanation. More free, more growth. Less free, less growth. So there's got to be some more subtlety going on with, with growth models. Um, so underlying what I'm talking about here is, is kind of implicitly the theory of economic growth, which has you know solo growth model, capital, labor, technology. But one of the reasons why I like to study a place like Zimbabwe is to remind us what these models lead out. And it doesn't explain this kind of growth here. Okay? It doesn't explain that. So what would explain it? So there have to be some external things going on. There have to be some external things. Um, here's just a, this is how bad their government is on the corruption scale. They're almost near the bottom. That's the bar. Um, Afghanistan, Myanmar. Equatorial Guinea and Turkmenistan in terms of corruption. So that doesn't explain it either. And, and, and they're, here they are here. They're actually getting worse over time. Okay? Notice Rwanda, if you know the story of Rwanda, has had an amazing comeback. 
A lot of that, I would argue, is in terms of better government. Botswana is about average, and then the United States has not been doing as well over time. And then Singapore is the number one most effective government. Um, as just, these are uh, World Bank governments indicators. Okay, so the new success story. Here is the collapse. That's where I spent about eight or ten years studying, which we talked about, loss of property rights, implosion, hyperinflation. And now here we have this new era, okay? The success story. Where is it coming from and why? And that's, that's what I'm thinking. Now, one thing to remember here is that absolute levels are often just as important or more important than percentage changes. So the first thing that when you see a, a, what looks like a success story, find out where you've been and where you're going and with levels. Because that looks, and when you go back and look at that, you might say, oh yeah, you know, okay, three years, oh, okay, they had three bad years, they had, you know, three good, maybe just a few more, three, three more years and they'll come back to where they are. So, actually that's totally off. So, let's look and see, okay? Because when you have declines, you have to more than make up for that. The way we calculate percentage changes, okay, so if you, you have an index that goes from 150, that's a 50% decline. We go from 50 to 100, that's a 100% increase. So the way we calculate index numbers are percent changes. You can see here that this is where, this guy line is where Zimbabwe was in 1960. They lost 50 years of development in 10 years. They lost 50 years. So they have a huge hole to get out of. Despite this good growth here, they're still 13% below where they were in 1960 terms of uh, GDP. So they have a lot to go. So that's, that's first of all, they're not, so, they're not quite a success story when you line it up here versus there that it might look. Um, they have a huge amount to go. Okay, the other thing here is, and this, is, this kind of goes back to my question after we sort of um, laid it out, but it's not quite as good as we thought. There's an interesting paper by Abden which talks about product complexity. And this is where I'm going with my research you now in Zimbabwe. Um, so what it shows here is that when you have products, or you have a lot of products in the economy, they tend to grow more, yeah, or higher GDP per capita. And that makes sense. Sort of, you're developing more, you've got a lot of eggs in one, uh, you don't have all your eggs in one basket. And, um, and so a, a very uh, rich, uh, complex economy is going to have higher GDP than a low one. Now this doesn't make sense with Zimbabwe either. Because what's happening with Zimbabwe, as I'm starting to look at this, is they're actually getting less complex. Hmm. They're actually getting less complex yet they're growing faster. So I'm sorry, were they ever complex? Like you said Yeah, I'll show you what the well, I'm gonna show you a relative relative picture here. Okay. So this is another interesting tool um, that and I'm going to show you the website for. It's called the Atlas of Economic Complexity. And it is a tool developed by uh, MIT grad students, actually. And it takes every single product and it groups them um, by color. Or, so the yellow is all agricultural products. And then it actually has them grouped next to other things that are related to them. So. Um, over there, you can't see whether it's cut flowers and maize meal. So they might have the raw materials with the bright yellow, and then they might have processed agricultural stuff next to it. So in 1995, if you counted all those up, uh, I think it's 770 products. And that's just export. Okay. Is that more complex than you thought Zimbabwe would be? Okay, so they make a lot of things, and it's not just raw materials. Now, what you, what you can see is if you take the same shot today, you can quickly see what's happened, right? That on the left, you see these boxes are getting bigger, and they have about 500 boxes now, 550, 700. You have um, the raw materials, the nickel, the gold, the diamonds, the tobacco. And this is the weird one. I have no idea what this is. It's unused postage has suddenly jumped to the biggest export. Third, $500 million in unused stamps? This is really quirky. 
and um, I think it's a, I think it's a hiding something. Yes. Are, are they highly decorated stamps, for example? But when De Gaulle was trying to hang on to the franc at an overvalued rate uh, in the late 60s, he started printing Monet's and Renoir's and stuff like that on the French postage stamps so people would collect them instead yeah. of using them. So, I mean, is that what's is going on? This is bigger than gold, bigger than diamonds. Yeah. This is $500 million. I agree with you. It's weird, but it's I, that's weird. all I could explain would be if they had nice pictures of tigers yeah. and elephants or something. I don't know. I've got some uh, inquiries into into some uh, colleagues of mine within Zimbabwe, John Robertson, who's been there forever. Would, would this include currency that they've like canceled? I don't know. I mean, are they selling it to eBay? You know? well, but the number, the number is just stunning, and what happens is it pops up in 2008, the same year of dollarization. It pops up from zero to 300 million and then 500 million. Out of nowhere. The industry has come up out of nowhere. In the industry. I think it's a masking industry, but I haven't found out what it is. But the takeaway here is the economy has gotten less complex. More raw resources, less complexity, less manufactured goods. Okay, just a quick, um, just show you where this is because some of you are interested in development. Here is the site, okay, and I think it's fascinating just to get your hands dirty, as we say, when looking at what we do. A lot of people like to say, we don't make anything anymore. In the United States, we don't make anything. Send them this website, and you can go around and you can see with every little thing here is alloy steel, here is optical fibers, here is mechanical therapy, cotton, blah, 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 blah. Articles of plastic cars. Okay, every one of these, and there are thousands of them in there. And what you can do, um, you can download the data over, I think, from 1995, and you can run visualizations. And I think it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. I think it's just a nice way to illustrate complexity when sometimes numbers overwhelm us. I think these kind of visual representations are really good. So that's called the Atlas of Economic Complexity, and uh, you can find some use for it as well. Okay. All right, so the top 10 exports in 95 were 56% of the economy. The top 10 today are 81%. Now the big story here is, the other thing is that manufacturing value, added value has gone down. So they're just getting, they're, they're doing less and less. And the big, yeah? How would you explain that in, in terms of the theory of comparative market? Well, what they're doing is they are going for, what they do well is they're just pulling these commodities out of the ground. And they're pulling on platinum and gold silver and so you know I think the comparative advantage at this point is well the, what let me let me that's a good question but I think we'd also have to step back and say the, the law of the <coughs> comparative advantage assumes functioning governments with long time frames right I mean I think it's implicit in there so this is a government that is not thinking long term because Mugabe's 88 years old he is thinking about how do we liquidate this economy, just like they melted down the irrigation pipes. How, you know, that's not really the issue. It's how do we get as much money now, right. even though the wealth may be going down and the GDP may be going down. That's not our concern. What our concern is we want to sell $100 million worth of diamonds to the Chinese and have that in offshore Swiss bank accounts. So, you know, it's not really a, a model of trade that we can generally talk about. Okay, it's based on corruption. Um, that's an excellent question. So the mining has gone up. So here's the mining. Um, and so my, my kind of first take on this, or my first hypothesis on how to approach this question, why does the world's worst managed economy grow faster than Hong Kong? Is I think it's sort of the metaphor of the people who arrive on the farm and melt down the irrigation pipes. I think it's that writ large, okay? They are taking the raw platinum, they're taking the gold, um, and they're selling it very quickly. They're not polishing it. They're not creating much value out of it. It is a very quick exchange. Um, and, and it's very short term because it's not going to last forever. They're not building up industries. So that's sort of the, the sad part. The other strange thing is that here again, you know, only in Zimbabwe, 
They don't have the license to print money anymore, but they sure can increase license fees. Look at with license fee for platinum. It was $150 last year. This year it's $500,000. Registration, $300 last year, $2.5 million this year. Yes? How much of this increase in the dollar output of the mining industry is from increasing world prices, and how much of it is the volume? Um, I don't have that disentangled. I know because I don't know what the proportion is. Commodity prices have quadrupled. Yeah, and, and I, I know they're linked. I and that's a very good question. That I, that's that's the one that I want to answer. I don't know what that is. I know I have looked at production in you know, kilograms or whatever, and it's definitely going up. Um, and they they're not stagnating. So the platinum mines are going full bore. The gold is going, going up. But I don't know exactly that. that part. And that's a very question that I should, that I should answer. So. Um, the government now is sort of serving as this monopolist where they rapidly increase the license fees. And here's the other thing that, that I want to answer and I don't have a good question on yet, is that the aid continues to go up. And I don't know why. You remember, they, they're, they're the world's, one of the world's worst government economies. It's getting worse. Why is the why is the world giving them more aid? Um, there's some kind of mysterious things. You know, I look in the balance sheets, and they have these things called off-balance grants. And it's one line item, it just says off-balance, and it's 20% of GDP. And it says off-balance grants, and then you go to the expenditure side, off-balance expenditures. Oh, and everything is exactly spent. And I've written to uh, a Ministry of Education, David Coltar, who's written me back, I have no idea. We got enough to buy textbooks. I didn't know there was any other money. Okay, we're talking about three or four hundred million dollars. That's unaccounted for. Um, he's inside the government. He doesn't. He hasn't seen it. The money goes in. The money goes out. It's about twenty percent of the government expenditure. And the IMF report, the IMF team went over there. And um, scarcely any mention of this was made in the report, except in the footnote, saying it went to food and aid, and, but nothing. I wrote to the I wrote to the IMF because every year they, they do these big Article Four reports, and I wrote to them, and I and I said, you know, can you please explain to the authors of this report? Can you please explain a line item that's 20 percent of the government expenditure? Where did that come from, and where did it go? Simple question. I got. Um, one person never wrote back, another person said, I'm off that desk now. I'm on Zambia. I'll refer you to the Zimbabwe team. Never, wrote, never, never got a response back. And then I wrote to John Robertson, the very famous economist in Zimbabwe, and he said, well, Craig, you're not going to believe this. The IMF team, they came this year, they, they were a completely new team. They had, no, had never studied Zimbabwe before. The whole team, other team was on another country. He said they don't know anything about the country, so it's not surprising. So the person who authored this report will not answer this question, and instead passes the report to somebody who's never studied the country. But this is the state of the IMF. And, um, and, and so when I talk about a culture in which aid goes up with no accountability, no tied to consequences about how this government is run, you know, it really makes you wonder and question the aid of the World Bank and the IMF and all the other uh, organizations which are giving them aid. So where I am from here, this is kind of where, where I'm going, is to, is to further explore this relationship. But there are a couple of things that have come out of the IMF report, which are number one. The debt burden that Zimbabwe has is unsustainable. It's, it's growing by leaps and bounds. And they're like the person who's paying 2% on their credit card every month for the credit card. The Zimbabwe's paying about 2% of its debt each year, and it's basically just, you know, to stay off our back kind of thing. But each year their debt is climbing and climbing and climbing. And now the, uh, the IMF has said, if they sold everything, their entire net worth of their country, all the platinum, they sold it all, let's say they sold it to the Chinese, all future prospecting rights, they could not pay off their debt. They had a negative net worth. I mean, imagine that. I mean, this country, you know, we talk about we have trillions of dollars of debt, but our net worth is surely positive. 
you know, in terms of all the land and everything they own and all everything on the land. They have a, they have the country has a negative net worth. So you know the the where they go from here, they're, they're um, the, the the banks are still wanting the money. You know, yet, yet they yet they're in the position that they're in. My my you know what I would say is if I were there is you know number one you have to improve property rights. Probably there's going to have to be debt forgiveness because let's face it that, that's it's debt on arrival they're bankrupt. But then uh, from from there and forth you know. Don't lend. Don't have any um, aid policies anymore because they have more than enough resources to take care of themselves. As you've seen, they have, uh, they have a huge amount of resources. And um, so, here's my conclusions from our three acts. So, upending property rights can quickly create conditions for a hyperinflation. Um, it's not guaranteed, but it can create real conditions of fragility. Um, development policies that focus on improving lives of subsistence farmers. Very one-way track to long-term poverty and environmental degradation. If that's exactly where most of the development aid is, is focused. And lastly, when countries are growing quickly, we have to look at the complexity of the economy. If the complexity is simultaneously diminishing while the country is growing, and I would argue that growth is probably likely to be pretty volatile. And Larry's point: when when commodity prices fall for platinum and gold. Zimbabwe could quickly plunge into a recession because its market basket of goods is so much less complex than it used to be. So it puts itself in a very dangerous position to be so reliant on gold and uh, silver and maybe those unused stamps. I don't know what the market is for that. So um, there, you know, it, it, having studied Zimbabwe for almost 20 years in terms of following back to the bank, it's one of these countries that is so beautiful. The people are wonderful. It's a very safe place to visit. It has so much potential. It's sort of right on the cusp. Elections are coming up next year. Mugabe's 88 years old. So I think there are prospects for, for hope there. Um, and that's a, I'll leave you with a shot of downtown Harare in October, which is when the beautiful purple jacaranda trees are in bloom. And uh, there's no place else like it that I've ever seen. So um, there's light at the end of the tunnel. I'm going to leave you on an optimistic note. Yes. Yeah. Uh, are you done on that? Yes. Yeah. Quick question. Um, before you get off, uh, show the, go on the internet and see if you can show them Victoria Falls and those have that little discourse. Um, I got a flyer from the Council on Foreign Relations affiliate in Cleveland recently and they advertise to senior citizens like me. They advertise uh, glorious trips abroad, go to the Great Wall of China, whatever. So. Uh, uh, the, the current one is Victoria Falls, uh, uh, they want, want you to tour, that's a good one, uh, they want you to tour Southern Africa including a side trip to Victoria Falls and uh, they, I, Craig and I were talking about it the other day, these tour groups will say go to Victoria Falls but they don't tell you it's not in South Africa, right? right. Where is it? Yeah, they'll just, you'll be in uh, Johannesburg, and you know one of the little daily excursions is Victoria Falls, and and they often don't announce to people that you're no longer in South Africa. You fly to this nice hotel, um, a couple hours trip, and uh, you know, some of these dumb tourists they don't know they're outside South Africa. But uh, yeah, this is a spectacular vista, and uh, people go bungee jumping off that bridge. Uh, about six months ago, a woman jumped off the bridge. The rope broke. Yeah. There's actually a video on you. Is that the one where she lives and like swims yeah. to the edge? And she everything? does, and there's crocodiles yeah. and everything. And I saw bungee cords all wrapped around her legs. Awesome. And nobody can get her. She's the only one who can save herself. Mm -hmm. And uh, she manages to swim, but she she looked like she'd been smacked on the back, but she luckily she you know, survived. Mm -hmm. They claim it was the only one in 50,000 jumps. So. Yeah, right. Anyway, but this, that's the, uh, yeah, this is on the border of Zimbabwe and Zambia, right? Zambia, right. right. And, uh, this is another. This is sort of crazy. People hang out in this. Um, it's coming up right over the edge. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Oh, actually, I. Uh, All right. Um, you didn't get into this much, but how has government spending changed over time, especially with dollarization? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I'm, I'm writing in my article about that. So, um, it's an interesting story. So, in 2007, I had an, um, I'll just use small numbers to make the case, but they're all relative. So, um, so in 2006, 2007, in the middle of hyperinflation, you can imagine, you have a really hard time collecting taxes. Mm -hmm. And so they have, um, let's say, they, they, I think it was like 140 million. It was, it was really small. And 2008 comes about, now everything's in dollars. And the ability to collect taxes goes up dramatically. So it goes up, I think, almost tenfold, okay, within, within a year and a half. Now you would think, you would think, I was you would think, you know, if your revenue goes up by tenfold, that you actually have a chance to run a balanced budget. But in fact, their expenses have been outrunning their, their, um, their taxes by, by millions, tens of millions of dollars. You know, I just, I said, this is ridiculous, come on. Because your expenditure curve is, I mean, your, your tax revenue curve is just going up like this. Why? Okay. They have suddenly found, um, they have about 70,000 what they call ghost workers. They are people collecting a paycheck. And these, all the government workers, 2%, um, I saw this from the government budget report, 2% of all the government workers collect 40% of all the income. So, and that includes these ghost workers, people who are just in, nobody knows what they're doing. The IMF's identified this thing. But again, it's always this little, you might want to do something about those ghost workers. You know, they, they sort of have these little throwaways in the reports. They should do something about the ghost workers. Well, they're paying off the IMF, you think? No, I don't think so. Yeah. I just think there's excessive politeness. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I have a colleague who's from Nigeria, so this is the closest that I uh, have, uh, have any information about this. But uh, in discussing the plight of the uh, of the farmers in, in that area, uh, his uh, observation is that for many, many centuries, the sort of communal lands has been the culture and the ethos of the people, and uh, they. Uh, had no famines or very few famines. Uh, they were good stewards of the land. Uh, they learned conservation practices and considered the land to be uh, the, uh, the, the, the sacred ground of everyone. And then uh, government intervention that took large parcels and again excluded it from the communal uh, uh, property and gave it to commercial farmers and other problems with the government uh, created this uh, overcrowding and subsistence uh, sort of living. Uh, and uh, his his idea is a uh, something of a of a return to the more original uh, uh, way of life uh, would would be helpful. What what's your thought about that? Well, you know, I guess it sounds very bucolic and romantic, and I, I'm just a little bit skeptical of yeah. life as a subsistence farmer. Um, because the fact of the matter is that when people get a chance to leave that life, they do. I mean, everywhere that I've seen now. I haven't seen this particular case in Nigeria, and I would, I read about it with open eyes. But what I've seen, if you look at China, 400 million people left the farms to go to the cities as fast as they could. I mean, it sort of happens everywhere that you see. So it may have happened, you know, like your friend describes, that the, that the government has parceled out these commercial lands. But we also know everywhere that we have communal lands, the land if it is, quote, taken care of, well, the, other, the first thing is, actually, it's really interesting. Communal lands are actually more complicated in terms of land rights than mm -hmm. private land. For example, if you own a, a little farm, and there's a tree that's like a 200-year-old tree that has fruit, everybody in the village gets to use that, and that's written into the law. If there's a stream, they have to have another law about that. People have access to the water. They can build their own ditches from your, your stream running through your land. So, on the one hand, I'm, I guess I'm just a little skeptical. You know, I, I, I would like to know how that works. The other thing to remember is that you could have communal lands work, maybe, for a while. But we have to remember that communal lands take up a vast amount of land, much more land, to work. 
than private land. Okay? Because they are not fertilized, they're not developed, they're not taken care of in the same way. So when you can have a small quarter acre plot that's owned, that's taken care of, if you think about England, right, has all these tiny little plots that were with stone enclosures. Well, I guess I guess one of the, the I mean, I, I, I certainly don't disagree with what you say, but uh, maybe one of the lingering problems which is confronting the world of aid organizations and things is this very deeply seated ethos uh, in Africa toward yeah. that kind of a communal setting, uh, stronger than perhaps elsewhere in the world, uh, is something that maybe uh, is, is going to be a, a larger obstacle to overcome, and therefore the transition is going to be more difficult and more extended. Yeah, and I, and I would say I think that's important. I honor culture. I think what, what people need to understand is that there, there may be a price following that cultural view, okay? In other words, if you want to have communal lands, that's fine and that's what you're comfortable with, but we shouldn't expect aid to bail you out, okay? People should know fully the cost of holding on to that because why is it over and over and over again, Sub-Saharan Africa, Somalia, Ethiopia are constantly needing aid? Yeah. It's because of a communal system that is very susceptible to famines. But, I, but what my colleague says is that colonialization of Africa in the 19th and 20th century uh, created these, uh, you know, monstrous uh, dictatorships when the uh, uh, colonialists left. And so in many ways the problem that was created in Africa was created by Western uh, uh, colonizers. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's certainly that's, a lot of yeah. problems created by but that's, that's less the case in Nigeria today. The main problem that I see for communization or communal living in Nigeria is the population of that country is just too damn big. Right. It's probably, I don't know what the population is, it's way over 100 million yeah, people. Like million. Yeah, and uh, so if you said, well, we'll all go back to the land, uh, maybe you could have done that 50 years ago, but you just simply cannot do it now given the population they have in hand. What's the population of Zimbabwe for comparison? I think it's like eight, eight or nine million. Eight or nine million, you know, and it's uh, uh, much, uh, you know, acres per capita available are, are much greater in Zimbabwe, and the land is better than it is in Nigeria. Northern half of the country is sub Saharan desert. Yeah, and the other thing I think that's important is that there are sort of generalizations we make about Africa. There are 53 countries, I think. And so when I went to Ghana, they're in a transition. I, I talked with the village chief, who had formerly owned all the land. And he was lamenting the fact that, quote, now he has nothing to do but mediate bad marriages. OK? Mm -hmm. Because, but when I talked with the individuals, they were actually happy. They are now getting land titles from the government. Every time the land, the chief owns land, but every time he wants a little cash, he can yeah. sell some of his land. That, he never gets that back. That land then goes, a title is created with, from the government of Ghana and sent to the owner. They're seeing a way of life go away, but they, you know, where you see those titles, you're, you're seeing investment. Right. That problem of communal land versus private ownership also exists in portions of Latin America and even to some extent in the American Southwest and Mexico. Uh, and uh, in New Mexico, at least, the peace the Indians have made with this situation is to say the reservation or the Pueblo is a place I go when I've tried life in the city and lost out and there's nothing left. I can always go back home to the reservation or the Pueblo. But the life there is almost, by definition, very poor, very limited uh, subsistence farming or lower. Um, and uh, the only place, the Navajo are a good contrast. They're a pretty aggressive and thriving people, by and large. And you drive around the Navajo reservation, and you see good roads, new trucks, reasonable housing, things like that. Uh, they have their own university system, um, and so you can make a go of it, but uh, 
what I was told was that it also may uh, depend on the degree of tight, close-held control of the entire commune by one family or one chief, mm -hmm. that usually that turns out to be a bad idea. You, you're going to stifle development if that happens. But where there's a large tribe, fairly diverse political structure, like the Navajos, life's not so bad. Yeah. Yeah, and just to just kind of quickly just in or follow up with your point, I, I think that there's a book written called Why Nations Fail that is a really good book that right. you probably enjoy reading. And um, it does address this notion of colonialism and the destruction that it caused and sort of looking at path dependence. So it is important. I'm not saying it's not important. But what I think is a real problem with a lot of people in development is to look at the past, blame it, and say, this is why things are today, and then kind of throw up their hands and say, this is why we need to get more aid. Right. And, you know, Zambian uh, economist uh, Demisa Moyo says it's the worst thing you can do. It's right. it's aid. It's, it's destroyed. And, and in most of these countries, increasingly, it's a long time ago now. Yeah, it's Mugabe a long time ago. Mugabe is noteworthy and I, and I because he's still it, there. Is it, you know, it's sort of escaping path dependence. I think Exhibit A on this is Rwanda. When you, you, know, you guys know that awful history about that, right? About the hundreds of thousands of people that were massacred. And you could never imagine 10 years ago foreign investors wanting to go to Rwanda. And it has every reason to be poor. It's landlocked, yeah. OK? Every reason Jeffrey Sachs would say geography matters, it's landlocked, it has no ports, it's tiny, and you know, there's not much there. And yet it's one of the fastest growing and it's getting more complex. Hotels are coming there, uh, telecommunications. Why? Because they have sound government, they have sound money. They're not perfect, but there is a lot of money flowing into Rwanda. So if anybody can escape the past, Rwanda can do it, then I say all these countries are, have that potential. Right. Um, I'll be quick since I know we have lunch coming up um, very soon. Um, and, and so there's there's two points I'd like to make, and I don't disagree about any of the like the story behind it. There's just some uh, the conclusions that I have a little questions about. The first is related to um, farming, and so some new uh, work um, seems to indicate that a lot of African farmers their their optimization function is maximizing utility instead of maximizing um, their profits. And so it seems like that would affect the conclusions that we generate about in terms of um, why they want to maybe farm over going to a different sector. And that might not be taken into account entirely. And uh, Austin Oglo's work, um, and you just mentioned why nations fail. Um, I mean, you've read this, so I don't want to reiterate it, but about half dependency. So I think what we would need to look at further and maybe in some model framework would be the weighting between path dependency and um, uh, property rights, et cetera. And I, I think Os Lobo's point is that property rights are very important in that when you look at colonialization, it ultimately comes back down to property rights and contractual institutions. Yeah. Um, so I don't think I, we disagree in that respect. I just am uh, emphasizing the relative weighting between different explanations. Right. The first one here, the, the paper that you mentioned, I haven't read, but when I hear optimizing utility versus profits um, for African farmers. So the first thing, the first question I'm going to go to, if I look at that paper you sent it to me, so the very first question I want to know is, do they own the land? Yeah. Because I'm guessing they don't. And if you don't own the land, of course you're not going to maximize profits. You're going to kick back and do the least amount you can, because next year there may be somebody else on that land. Yeah. So why, why you're going to do the amount that it takes just to get by, because uh, in, in, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, as we saw, the majority of people don't own their land. So it, it totally makes sense that they're, they're not going to be making as much money as possible. Yeah, and I, I should um, double check the paper, because that could have been an assumption that was being made. Well, also, also and it's very, you know, it's very common for these kind of assumptions to be made, because people coming from the Western world are, are, are totally taking property rights for granted. And, and, and that's why it's so important to travel and go to these places and just see it in front of you. See what's right in front of you, you know? Yeah. And that's why it was so when I went to Zimbabwe and I saw the farmer who said the title is everything to me. 
and then next door the person who doesn't have a title, I mean, it's just remarkable, you know, his, he, what he's done in terms of his family's taken care of, he has, you know, he's saving, he's thinking. The biggest thing, the biggest point I make about property rights is, forget about all the networks and everything, the biggest point is the time horizon totally changes. You're, you're thinking not just about today, you're thinking about, well, your, you're thinking about your kids and your grandkids. And uh, there's a great Chinese expression that says that, uh, it says a good society is when the grandparents plant trees for the shade of their grandchildren. Right. So uh, I think that's uh, I, I just that's wanted the time horizon changes. <coughs> the, the comment I'm going to make it changes nothing about the conclusions there, but it's perfectly normal and rational and reasonable to maximize utility instead of profits. You, profits right. are, are an Absolutely. argument in the utility function. Right. Um, everything else goes right through them. You know, the long term and all that stuff. It's just, so I, I want to keep the focus on that. Yeah. But, but your, everything you say goes right through. Well, the optimization function, depending on what you're optimizing, that can affect the outcome depending on the problem. So here it might not. I mean, we haven't run an optimization problem. I'm not following. Okay. So, I mean, the way that the way that, that individuals operate and what they're optimizing, that will affect their bundle that they choose. Well, of course, but, yeah. but I mean, they're optimizing utility. I mean, what else, why so, would they not they optimize their, their own but, utility? But, but I mean, if they make business decisions to optimize utility instead of, um, like, a, like a firm does, profits, that will, I think, certainly affect the outcome. Yeah, but that's, that has nothing to do with the titles and things like that. But that affects their choice to do farming versus something else, as we have a production function where oh. the goods are to restrict the other outcomes. Larry, you want to try but, to... Here, here, the way this is observed is you see people consuming a lot of leisure. But if you see them consuming leisure rather than, say, repairing the irrigation ditch, you have to ask, do they own the land? Yeah, that's, well, I there you that, go. That's a central question. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, when I was in Zimbabwe, this is the, so the World Bank official I, I met in the lobby of the hotel said, you know, I'm so frustrated with, with these people. And I said, why? I said, you know, we gave them, uh, in this village we provided these water pumps. And, uh, you know, you come back five years later and they're broken. And I said, oh, really? And they said, yeah. I said, who, who owns the pumps? And it was like a newsflash. Like, she never thought who owned them. <laughs> you know, who's, who's responsible for this? Oh, yeah. Well, nobody owns them. Right. Well, of course. Who's going to, in a village of 50 people, who's going to fix it? Moreover, they don't ever train people how to fix or maintain. It's all about getting the goods out the door. And that's how their, their success is measured. So, the, you know, I say this to my development classes. I say the biggest word that nobody mentions at the World Bank is with a capital M, maintenance. Nobody right. builds that into their budgets because it's not sexy, it's not fun. You know, you'd rather have a big project. Nobody thinks about maintenance, and if you don't own things, you're not going to maintain them. Yeah, yeah. no incentive to you. Yeah. Two, two questions then, uh, Mr. Song and Sonny, and then we'll have to go. Oh, that's it. So, how do you think about the 99 years lease in Zimbabwe? What's the incentive for government to sell the house lease or property rights for only that's not years that now that's permanently Yeah, well, you know, as you know, in China they have seven year leases. Uh, it, it depends for the family and the 30 years and for the commercial and the same thing. Seven, yeah. So, what kind of problem can it be? Well, yeah, I've asked different people. I, I mean, I think it's, um, it's almost like a philosophical thing. You know, if you, if you, um, I think in China the government owns all the property, they can kind of give lip service to that. And then they can say, we're giving you 99 year lease. But just remember, we always own the property. Yeah. Um, the rent. yeah, and so I said to the woman uh, that I met who had a seven year lease, I said, well, you know, what happens, uh, you know, at the end of seven years? So I don't care, I'll be dead. And, uh, but I said, what happens if you sell it to your kids? And then she said, well, I mean, how does that work? How does the market price it as you get closer and closer? 70 years, and you know, this is where things get into be a problem, because when you start getting 60, 61, 62, and you start getting closer, what happens now is the market's gonna price the risk into, right. is that lease gonna be renewed at, for a fee? How big's the fee gonna be? There's uncertainty. 
And, and so these leases work well until they start to get to the end. Um, so I think right now, 70 years, 99 years, it's going to work just fine. But it's not ideal. I'd rather have a freehold title. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Um, I'm going to draw a parallel between this and uh, the feudal lands in Pakistan. And one of the uh, one of the economic arguments that is against giving property rights is, is that feudal lands own a huge chunk of land, and so they have economies of scale and production. So if you break down the land, the production is going to decrease. Mm -hmm. right. So what would be the economic argument against that? Right. They went through that. In Zimbabwe, when the big commercial farms were broken up, yeah. the peasants So what, what, what are the arguments well, yeah, about production? I, guess, I, I need to learn more about, about Pakistan, but the, if you have a feudal system, then you have people who are tied to land that can't leave the land, right? So the first thing I'd want to know is, maybe it is better to have bigger farms, and you know, there are economies of scale, but what we have to figure out is, how do we release all of these people who work on a farm? I mean, there's some probably future economists working on that farm, right? Future comedians, physicists, all these people with all these talents who are locked up on a farm. As peasants. As peasants, right? And, and, you, and you think about all those peasants and all the different things that they've been in the education system. So I would want to figure out how do we give them mobility? How do we give them mobility? You know, and, and maybe I, I don't know how to do that because I haven't thought yeah, about that. The compromise might be the Ukrainian solution of give them land title vouchers, yeah. which they can sell or trade well, yeah, that's if they want to leave the farm. If you did that, that's right. You would you give everybody a, a deed, and most of the people, in my view, would, would get off the farm. Right. They would take their cash and run right. as fast as they could to the city and open up a business. One, one last question about Zimbabwe before we go. Um, Craig and I, for several years, did a dog and pony show uh, called Pakistan and Zimbabwe. And uh, the, uh, the link between the two countries, as I jokingly put it, was at the time, this goes back five years and earlier, uh, but the, the link was that these were the only two countries in the world where attorneys were beaten daily on the streets of the capital. Yeah. And, uh, they were both protesting against the existing set of laws and trying to get the regime changed, but uh, this was true. But how are the attorneys doing in, in Zimbabwe today? I think it's so. calmed down. It's, uh, tourists are coming back, which is a good, a good sign. And mm -hmm. Relative calm in the streets. I think that the dollar has done a lot for taking the edge off of things. Mm -hmm. You know, when you had people who would get a paycheck and, and um, would have to run to the bank and, and lines around the block got that money um, out of the bank because the, you can imagine the edge it puts on your life if prices are doubling every, every 24 hours. So there's a lot less tension. And so yeah, you don't hear about those things as much. And, and meanwhile, back in Pakistan, are they beating the attorneys anymore or did that stop? Um, actually, the attorneys uh, got this whole revolution and they opened to each and now there's more rule of law than it was before. Mm -hmm. All right, so let us adjourn photo day up at the uh, castle, by the way.